This is the story of the Dodge Power Wagon, one of those surprising and unexpected stories growing out of the war, where machines, as well as men, turned in records of such remarkable accomplishments. Hundreds of letters came to Detroit from homecoming GIs, asking for a civilian crack at those military cars that would go anywhere, whether there was road or not. So engineers at Dodge made a decision. They took the same powerful motor and the same near indestructible chassis of their war trucks redesigned the body to civilian lines, added a comfortable, deep cushioned cab, and called the unit Power Wagon. They had no vision and very little expectation of how the truck would fit civilian needs. It was a Dodge experiment, but it was felt something might happen, and something did. From Florida to the Pacific Northwest, from Maine to California, from New Orleans to Chicago, and from the deserts of the Southwest to the wooded hills of New England, Wherever there was a job that ordinary trucks had failed in, men with imagination began to say, maybe a power wagon will do the job. And it did, time after time. Thus was born the now nearly legendary saying, a power wagon can do anything. It'll milk your cows or move your mountains. It was then that Dodge men in Detroit began to get the real vision. Go out and see what people are doing with the power wagon, they told us, and take your cameras with you. So we went. And this film is a story of what we saw. First, however, you must remember, the power wagon was a war baby. You recall the beginning, that day in the Pacific, December 7, 1941. It was war. The Army called in top men from Dodge. We need trucks that can carry men, supplies, and weapons wherever they need to go, the Army officer said. There may be no roads. And certainly there will be all kinds of obstacles, from exploding bombs to the muck, sand, mire, and mountains that nature and geography will throw at us. But the trucks must still keep going. That was the order, an army order. The specifications were in, but the answers were still to be found, and the job of building such vehicles still to be done. Dodge went to work, and over the factory and testing ground, the engineers and the mechanics, the test drivers and the production chiefs, the laboratories, and the blueprint tape. The sound of battle hung in the air. Vehicles that'll do anything, go anywhere, be too tough to stop or stall. Trucks, trucks, trucks. Those words seemed a part of the explosions and the roar of the guns. For many months, you remember, the Allies fought a defensive war. We'd been caught flat-footed, and it took time to marshal our offensive strength. But American boys were tough, and so were their guns. Their marksmanship was excellent, and they used well the material they had at hand. It was just enough to keep them hanging on until the real force of American production could arrive. And finally, Dodge trucks began to roll. They turned in prodigious records of work, power, and ability to get through. Still, at home, test ground operations went forward day and night. These units were given the most punishing kind of treatment. Mud, water, torturous heat, sand, dust, and rough ground. Nothing except being blasted apart could stop them for very long. This was war, and only the fit could survive. The fit among men, and the fit among machines. And these Dodge trucks were fit.
But might and the forces of right finally turned the tide for us. Hitler's end, Mussolini's fall, and the Japanese surrender all became history. No longer were armor and bullets the great need, but trucks that could go anywhere, do anything, still looked good to the men coming home to tackle the tough jobs of U.S. home competition. Those letters began arriving daily in Detroit. How about a truck like the one I drove to Bastogne? How can I get a four-wheel drive truck like the one we used as an ambulance? How soon can I buy? And so they went. The die was cast, and at Dodge, the dies were ready. Dodge trucks of war became the power wagons of peace. Men's imaginations turned from destruction to construction. And as men's imaginations went, so went the power wagon. This was where we left Detroit with our cameras. Our first stop seemed somehow not unlike the wartime push. At least there is urgency and desperation here. The Mississippi is on a rampage, and power wagons of the U.S. Army Engineering Corps are right at home, fighting. This time it is Old Man River, not the Nazis or the Japs. Here the fight is with mud as well as water, and the power wagon we are with hardly hesitates. It pushes right on through. The levy patrol chief is on the job too. There is 24 hour vigilance, for a break would mean disaster. Vigilance is the great need here. Vigilance and an army of workers with sandbags. Here is a place that needs attention immediately, the beginnings of a break. And down on this side of the levee is the danger spot, a spongy mass where seep water from above is beginning already to come to the surface. But the army of workers and the sandbags are not far behind. You have only to be here to sense the grim tenseness in the atmosphere, an air of expectancy as if any moment might bring sudden emergency, news of a break somewhere along the many miles of levee. But there is a certain sense of assurance too, born of years of experience with the river. It can be tamed, but you have to watch it. Keep it under tight rein, something like keeping a headstrong, determined child in check. You can't afford to give either one an inch of advantage. So vigilance and work go on. People, homes, and farms are here to be protected from tragedy and ruin. Florida is our second stop, and soon we're out in the orange groves to watch the picking and the hauling. Florida is famous for many things, certainly her citrus crops. The harvest each year runs into millions of dollars. Experienced pickers are handling the fruit, and a large group of them work together in one area of the orchard each man picking all the fruit on one tree. He's paid by the number of boxes he picks. So by taking an entire tree, he can boost his average by picking rapidly on the ground, making up what he loses in time by having to climb a ladder. This way, it's a fair shake for everybody. The orchard soil is very sandy. Plowing through it with trucks to gather up the boxes of fruit or to spray the rows of trees has always been an irritating and expensive problem. We were always replacing broken gears and drive shafts, one owner told us. Starting, stopping, making sharp turns around trees in this sand tears the insides right out of a truck. So the owner found his answer. Spraying equipment in the regular power wagon bed. A special low platform body on the power wagon chassis for brute pickup. The broken gear bugaboo was licked. Four wheel driving power for the orchard sand and 55 mile an hour conventional two wheel drive speed on the highway between orchard and packing house. No wonder the power wagon idea is spreading in the citrus orchards of Florida. Throughout this whole area of the Deep South, from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River, are found great spreads of soft pine forest furnishing pulpwood, turpentine and resin to commercial industry for the thousands of uses to which these products are put. These pine forests are constantly patrolled to ensure them, as far as possible, against their greatest enemy, fire. In spite of the care and money spent, thousands of acres are burned out every year, and additional money is budgeted to reseed the burned out areas. 
If there are plenty of seed trees nearby, nature and the wind take care of the reseeding automatically. But where seed-bearing trees are too distant, the nature process would take too long. So the work is done by men, setting out seedlings in ground previously plowed and made ready. The seedlings will grow to usable trees in approximately 10 years. So fire is a costly thing, as these years of time are lost, as well as the young trees which go up in smoke. We visit several of these forest areas to see the work go on, and we find power wagons in constant use because of their ability to get over ground where less rugged and less powerful vehicles would be absolutely impractical. Perhaps the most important work in these forests assigned to the power wagon is patrol duty and actual firefighting. Such work goes forward constantly, both on industry-owned properties and in tracks owned by individual states. Here we ride out with a forestry division head to review the work done on one of these big tracks. Their power wagons are radio-equipped, firefighting apparatus including a large tank of water with power pump takeoff from the motor is also a part of each unit. Here it is explained to us that the great damage done by fire is not to the larger trees, but to the younger ones, especially the seedlings just coming through the grass and leaves. The fast moving flames destroy these seedlings completely. One of the most widely used implements in grass fire combat is this fire plow attached to a power wagon. The speed and ability of the wagon to get over rough ground makes the plow most effective. It is used everywhere, north, south, east, west, wherever the danger of fire is present. And now we get a first-hand demonstration of why forestry patrol crews swear by power wagons. We're dubious about the truck getting through here, but these boys show no hesitancy. They plunge right in, and we soon understand why they aren't worried. With all four wheels spinning, the men just reach down, so to speak, and pull themselves out by their own bootstraps. It's almost that simple with the power winch. From the time the truck stops, hopelessly stuck, so far as conventional driving power is concerned, until we're out and on our way again, is less than five minutes. As long as you can find a place to fasten that cable, and there are 225 feet of it, you can't stay stuck with a power wagon. Then suddenly it happened, fire, the kind we've been hearing about. We didn't want to see trees burn, of course, but if a fire had to happen, we've been hoping it would do it while we were around. And now, here it is. The fellows in the power wagon lose no time. They come rushing up to the fire, and by the time they're within range, the power pump is working, and the actual fight begins.
At this point, we begin to wonder if the power wagon won't catch fire too. But before that happens, the driver moves on to areas not quite so hot. But we're still remembering that tank of gasoline not many inches above the burning coal. It's quite a fight for a while. A sudden wind caught the grass flames, and we wondered if we shouldn't radio for more help. But before long, the fire is under control, and once again, the power wagon has won. There were no restrictions or geographical limitations to our trip. So when word reaches us that power wagons are being used up north in the blizzard-swept areas for hauling feed to stranded cattle, we decide to leave the southern sunshine and hurry north to record that chapter. During the Wyoming-Nebraska blizzards of 49, we knew power wagons had been used extensively to reach starving cattle, but we hadn't seen it. Now we are here. We can get the story firsthand. With a big snow blade hooked onto the front, we start for the cattle area. The blade gives added weight to the front wheels for traction and can also be used, of course, to clear a road when necessary. There is a two to three inch ice crust on the snow, which makes the going really rugged, especially where the snow has drifted or where we drop into deeper areas. We should have brought chains, but we push ahead and keep coming closer to where the cattle are being brought up to a spot we think we can reach. We must get to the hay too before we do the cattle. That is cached at what was felt would be a convenient spot once, so it takes us most of the day to complete our mission. But when the hay and the cattle finally meet, it is worth far more than the day's work to see the scene that follows. It takes a few minutes for the men to start spreading the hay. But when they do, the cattle begin crowding around. They follow the men like famished children. They stumble and stagger in the deep snow. The ice crust breaks under their weight, and many have hurt their legs in the effort. But the hay appears to make everything all right. Hungry animals are much like hungry human beings in their actions, and it warms us inside to watch the cattle eat. Contentment actually settles over what a few minutes ago was a wide area of cold, inhospitable snow. Contentment and a feeling of great relief. From Texas, we head west to Arizona and finally end up on one of the large farm ranches of the Salt River Valley, some 21 miles from Phoenix. The Salt River Valley is one of the agricultural garden spots of the United States. It is famous for many products, but especially citrus fruits, melons, truck gardens, alfalfa, grains, and date palms. Irrigated from the great dams of the Salt River, the valley, once a cactus and mesquite desert, now boasts farmland prices above $1,000 per acre and worth every cent of it. 
Here, too, road maintenance is an important factor, and these people use a regular road grader for power wagon attachment. It keeps the road smooth, well-packed, and well-drained. They're in top condition all the time. Back at the machine shed, they hook up their three-bottom 14-inch plow to the lift at the back end of the truck. This is always an important day on an Arizona ranch when they are ready to break open another section of virgin desert. And with the power wagon instead of the old tractor, the event has achieved somehow an added thrill. When we arrive back at the wide open section, we begin to sense the feeling Junior and his father have expressed. The first time a plow has ever broken this desert soil, and the furrow will be a full half mile long. Head straight for that needle at the west point of Superstition Mountain, we shout after Spence, and see how straight a furrow you can plow the first time. The power wagon pulls away into distance. Suddenly I remember how it used to be when I was a boy with a team of horses and a walking plow. How I'd always take pride in that first straight furrow and how after that I'd walk behind that plow for 14 hours a day to plow an acre and a half of ground. They'll plow that much here in an hour without moving off that cushion seat or getting out of the cab. Down in Georgia, we saw farmers using big disc plows instead of these three bottom mold boards. There are different types of plows, of course, for different types of soil, and the power wagon pulls them all. We follow along now, getting our shots and listening to the drone of the truck motor and the desert soil scouring on the apron of the plows. sticks his head out the window and looks back. The wide ribbon of turning earth falls behind the three plows. This is the good earth of good America. This is the good earth of good America. How reassuring is the sound of plows in the soil instead of bombs and shells in the sky. In still another field, the soil is being prepared for seeding, and the spring tooth harrow is the implement to do the job. Pulling the harrow is little effort for the power wagon. The fields of the desert are as flat as floors, and it's possible to get over a lot of ground in one day. One of the things we've been most impressed with on the trip so far has been to see how modern farm machinery and portable motor power takes only hours to do jobs which used to take days. Many farmers own more than one power wagon and work them together as Spence and Junior are doing here. This way they can prepare and see big acreages in the time it used to take for one small field. Here, Spence refills the cedar. He's planting barley grown mostly for feed in this area. This is one of the best things about the power wagon, he says. We can carry our seed grain right along with the drill, and it doesn't take any time to refill the hoppers when they get empty. And that's just another way the power wagon saves time and money on the farm. You carry your working materials, seed, tools, and supplies right along with you as you go. And when you want them, they're there. Three or four minutes here, and the feeder is on its way again. As the hours pass, the pile of full sacks disappear, and the empty sacks pile up.
Alfalfa is one of the money crops in the Salt River Valley. The abundant yield gives the farmer an important income after his own feed requirements are provided for. An average of six cuttings in a season is common, and it isn't unusual to harvest even a seventh. Here, Spence and Junior load up the power wagon and the trailer. The bales weigh 60 to 70 pounds each. And when the men finally quit, 122 bales are aboard. That makes the power wagon something of a hauling unit, don't you think? This western country is not called the wide open spaces for nothing. And farmers must have dependable economical trucks for fast transportation. That's where the power wagon fits. Power where you need it, with eight speeds forward in four-wheel drive. Speed where you need it, on the open highway, in conventional two-wheel drive. And here the load comes, out of the barn, toward the highway. And here it comes, in from the desert, in past the citrus orchards, and in over the canals toward town. When the West was young and ranches the size of empires were being encircled with barbed wire, one of the cowboys' most important jobs was that of riding fence. In those days, patrolling the fence line was a solitary, hard, day-to-day -day business, and the fence rider's best friend was his pony. Well, horses are still useful on a ranch, but mechanical progress has made them obsolete on fence patrol. With this power wagon, Spence and Junior cover many times the amount of fence a man on horseback could possibly do, and they carry the posts, wire, and tools to make repairs right with them. Sand, rocks, mesquite, all difficult for a horse and completely impassable for an ordinary truck, offer no obstacle at all to the power wagon. Here is a place where the fence is down. A post is missing. The power